Okay, Dr. Khaled, I think we can uh, slowly start. First of all, thank you for uh, accepting my invitation. Um, have you been to Egypt before? Or, uh, yes, there... yes, yes, yes. Several times. I really miss it. Uh, despite the fact that my wedding holiday was in Cairo and I, I divorced, but I, have, I married second time, so I have to come with my better wife to Egypt again. <laughs> So her honeymoon was in Cairo? Yeah, it was, it was in the south, and um, but I've been one day in Cairo, yeah, or okay. two days. Okay, interesting. Okay, we have uh, 15 participants so far. We, uh, I think we can start. Hello, Dr. Khaled? Yes, I'm waiting for your introduction. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, so uh, there's no, uh, as I said, it's a casual uh, webinar. So thank you, Dr. Khaled, for uh, accepting our invitation. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to see what you have to say about uh, the latest in ovarian cancer. Okay, so Hisham, thank you. Salam alaikum. So I was born in Berlin. My parents came from Morocco originally in the 60s. And I was starting here. I was born here. I was a nurse. I was assistant. And now I'm the director of um, the Department of Gynecology with the Center of Oncological Surgery. And I'm really proud uh, to give with you this presentation and I think sharing experiences is, is everybody uh, beneficial. So thank you very much. So what I really like, oh, it's stopped. Why it stopped? One second. We have to go back. Uh, and I don't know why. It's okay. Something happened. One second. I will be in time. No problem. One second. I don't know why. Okay. One second. Buff. Share screen again. Yeah, yeah, I have only to look where my presentation is. So. Yes, so I'm sharing again. Smahloli, one second. One is, uh, hmm. one second. Where is the presentation? It's lost. Lost, lost, lost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now it's there. Okay. So, okay. I'm really proud to talk with you about the ovarian cancer insights and only to explain uh, to you, I'm a gyne-oncologist, um, so I do surgery, I do my diagnostic, I do even the chemotherapy, I do even the subsequent treatment and the palliative treatment, so I think it's really important that we have storytelling. I think it's important that we have a network to to treat the best patients. And I'm, I'm, I learned so much from my visceral surgeon and we are very, very close. Um, and we need, there's no discipline can cover ovarian cancer alone. That's very, very clear. And that's the reason why I think it's, it's important that we understand. So ovarian cancer, you know, is not anymore one disease. Ovarian cancer is a summary of several diseases, what is in most of the cases, peritoneal dominated. But there are some patients with lymph node dominated ovarian cancer. And we have patients, especially if the origin cancer came from the fallopian, what is really lymph node dominated. That's different to the classical high grade ovarian cancer with the multiple lesions in the peritoneum. And then we have to understand, we talk about high grade and we talk about low grade ovarian cancer. And we know that the etiology is different and even low grade cancer are not homogeneous. We have patients with a very low proliferation key 67, around seven in high grade is 78. But you have some patients with low grade ovarian cancer, they have key 67 of 20, 30%. So we are still learning, learning, 
like we know in endometrial cancer is different. That's the same in ovarian cancer. And phenotyping is only the start. And even, even if you talk about clear cell ovarian cancer, it's a different disease. And we know the association with endometriosis. And we have some patients with the problem of the compartment of the ascites with all secondary impact on quality of life, on mobility. And then you have patients without the compartment problems with a dry carcinoma. That's a different tumor pattern, the two, two different tumor biology. So what I like only to underline that most of the high grade ovarian cancer are accepting the tumor barriers to the extra and to the retroperitoneum. This is different to cervical cancer or endometrial cancer. But some tumor types, such as low grade, they are generally even similar to other cancers with the broke uh, of the barriers to the extra and to the retroperitoneum. And that's very important for our surgery and even for our possibility to make bolus tumors and all the other things. So again, it's not the same issue. So what I like to highlight with you, not only what is possible, I only to give you some insights from my philosophy, how to moderate a patient. And I'm really proud that we just today, um, again, uh, approved as a center of, um, of excellence for ovarian cancer by the ESCO, because I think, again, let's talk about moderation of the different elements because over survival, is completely different in a patient where you have the best surgery, the best chemo, the best maintenance approach in a row, and you cannot compensate anything. And maybe we can discuss, and I know the differences in neoadjuvant and high pick. I know all the stories, but let's try to look what is additional possible. So again, think about surgery in ovarian cancer. We started in ovarian cancer without any surgery. We started with a little bit too much biking. Then we increased the complete resection rate up to 50 to 70% by using multivisceral techniques. And then we now introduce even maintenance approach. So it's a different time because surgery is not only one, the treatment option. So we have to bring it in a umbrella of all the other elements. The bad news is that surgery is always one of the backbone of ovarian cancer management despite PARP inhibition and the engineers. The good story is that this effect of the tailored treatment are much higher in patients where you achieve complete resection than you have a patient with residual tumor mass. Because it's fake news to believe that chemo or maintenance approach is only suitable and effective in patients with residuals. That's wrong. That's wrong for chemo, wrong for bevacizumab, it's wrong for PARP inhibition. I will try to show you later. So if you look on the treatment decision-making process using all the elements, how you make the decision to treat, then we have to be aware that most of these items are eminence-based and emotional-based. It's not bad. I'm a scientist and medicine is even sharing experience. It's not always hardest evidence, but we have to be aware that these elements are emotional and try to select the criteria and even to look what is your attitude to this. And if we talk about neoadjuvant, HIPEG, whatever, I will tell you it's nonsense, nonsense to make neoadjuvant chemo or high dose chemo in a low grade ovarian cancer. It's, it's nonsense because there is no dose dense relationship for these cancers. If you have a cancer with low grade ovarian cancer with a low proliferation rate, then chemo is not effective, whatever you give and however you want to give. So we have to be really clear in our knowledge and then to look which patient needs primary surgery, which patient needs interval surgery, 
and which patient doesn't need any surgery. Because at the end of the day, our patients expect from us long-term survival that they want to, to see. And that's the reason why I like to moderate it based on the different approaches. And what we have even to know, because we talk about, always about frailty, and, but we know that if you give a patient, an elderly woman, only carboplatinum as a chemo, it's significant inferior to give texel carbo. So sometimes we believe to give lower quality of treatment and surgery and chemo, and we believe it's better, but no, especially in frail patients. And that's the reason why I like to highlight even some, some ideas about um, prehabilitation and enhanced recovery. It's much more than fast track. Fast track, you know, was introduced in the 70s, never reached the world. So some items um, may be introduced, but it's far away from giving to the patient power back. So what we started with a 4 million euro funded project by the German government to introduce prehabilitation and enhance recovering. And we just started this program. And my patients, for instance, are moving to the theater without a bed, because it's even important to empower the woman. And it's even to look on pre-operative management. So what we do in the pre-operation to understand which patient's frail, I will tell you, we did many, many studies. I show you only one presentation. Um, the strange, the hands grab strange is one of the most relevant predictive factors for any complication and the most driver for complication is bone resection, whatever you do. If you do a colostoma and osteomosis, why it's it maybe a signal of aggressive cancer or maybe we destroy the microbiome, what, whatever. But if you have a patient with bone resection, complication risk increased significant. Emboli, pneumonia, all the stories. That's only to be aware. Um, and that's the reason why we try to train the patient before we go to surgery and not chemo is the answer um, of frail patients. It's much more to look to improve the health status by training, to by physical training, um, by training the ribs, to prevent pneumonia, lung emboli. So we have a one to three weeks program before we go to a cancer surgery, what is, you know, in media and 240 minutes up to eight, nine, 10 hours. And we try to revise the anemia. We give the best um, medical treatment for pain. And we try to educate the patient. That's the reason why they move to the theater to empower the woman. Um, and even to try to, uh, avoid long-term fasting. You know that you are allowed two hours before surgery to drink a, um, a soda or whatever. Uh, but we know that especially in frail patient, we sent him center for fasting 60, 17 hours up to, uh, and it's much more difficult uh, to, uh, the, the, to the patients. So this only one study where we looked what is the most relevant uh, predictive factor. We, did, we do multiple uh, function assessment, but I told you, we, so we do in all my patients bioimpedance analysis. We look on the nutrition score. We look always on the electrolytes. We always look on the polypharmacy to clean the medical drugs. And we try to train the patients again, one to three weeks to go in the prehabilitation, preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative concept, the ERAS4 plus algorithm. And again, there are many, many things. It's even, so what we do, we do hypertemia during surgery, not for the chemo, but we did studies to show that if you have a hypertemia, not very high, but uh, a little bit above the body temperature, 
you have less one tier links problems, you have less bleeding problems, and it's it's very positive for the volume uh, management. So nevertheless, we can talk later about this program. It's still an evolution. We published uh, our protocol, but um, I think it's much more again than only fast track. And only to underline that again, we have to look on the best supportive treatment in the beginning. So what we do again, one to three weeks, we train the patient then to go to surgery and not make a bridge by chemotherapy because we believe that um, surgery after chemotherapy is not such effective uh, than uh, if you make it in a chemo naive patient. This um, the schedule, I try to bring it. And again, you know, even the gap between starting surgery, starting chemotherapy, we did many trials. So there's no difference, even in a patient with residual tumor mass. If you start chemotherapy one week, two weeks, three weeks, or up to eight weeks after surgery, no differences in progression-free survival, no differences in over survival. So there's no evidence that you... Uh, go immediately in surgery. There's no evidence to go immediately in chemotherapy. Uh, we don't talk about bowel obstruction or the acute situation. It's a different story. So what I like to uh, underline, yes, complete resection is the most important uh, prognostic factor. There's no doubt. But if you cannot do complete resection, it's not black and white. So what I do in my center is then to change your brain and your perspective and to look, can you do surgery under the consideration to improve the symptom control, such as bowel obstruction or damage control, what means bowel perforation, ascites, um, abscess or whatever, and to look about condition control if you plan to give subsequent bevacizumab, for instance, or chemo or, um, or um, PARP inhibition, um, therefore I do sometimes peritoneal clearing even in a tumor uh, pattern if they have epidiaphragma uh, lymph node, because that's not the story. Um, and we can talk even later what I believe is the meaning of positive lymph nodes in the uh, mediastinum. So this is the algorithm, what we try to do. We do always primary surgery. If we cannot, um, then we try to reduce the number of chemotherapy. We like to give weekly chemotherapy, for instance, six applications weekly, carbo AC2, Texol 80 milligram, and to look if the patient can run, for instance, in surgery or uh, we do the bridging concept, yeah? So if the patient of emboli or something, then you cannot run always immediately in the surgery uh, regarding these stories. So again, it's not black and white. And in my center is if the doctor of my consultant cannot reach complete resection, they have to call a second consultant to confirm this, if this is really uh, the, uh, the situation. So... Um, I only, again, want to uh, bring in this slide together that we have patients uh, with different tumor patterns. So if you have a patient with symptoms, it's always an inferior survival as a patient by chance, by CT scan or uh, by asymptomatic uh, diagnosis, only to be aware of this. So the first line approach in our center is to do um, surgery, then we do um, fast track BRCA in the blood. If the patient is BRCA negative, then we do the HRD tests. We can discuss it. I know it's not always available, but we have in Germany the approval for Olaparib and uh, Bevacizumab in patients with BRCA positivity or uh, HRD positivity. In patients with stage four, or residual tumor mass, we have even the approval to use niraparib. Um, and we can even use olaparib alone in BRCA positive uh, patient. And we have uh, just finished um, our guideline 
our update and we defined a maintenance treatment as a should a recommendation. So this is uh, our uh, way. And what I even like um, mean minus three and three means that you make your plan before you start the chemo, then re-evaluate re after three cycles and re-evaluate after six cycles regarding efficacy and toxicity. And maybe you have to modify uh, your maintenance approach after surgery. So only some items to relapse ovarian cancer. We have much more differences in ovarian cancer patient because some of them came asymptomatic. Some of them came by daily CR125 monitoring. And we have in general, the level change of the tumor pattern from the pelvic area to the upper abdomen. So uh, we know we have different uh, patient profiles. We have much more patients with brain metastasis. And I did many studies in brain and bone metastasis in ovarian cancer. It's always not a good signal, but even the dynamic of the disease makes a difference. And even in brain metastasis, very few women will die due to the brain metastasis, but some of them, most of them, regarding pleural fusion or uh, bone obstruction. So brain is not a contraindication to do any uh, medical uh, treatments for them. Maybe we can discuss one or the other cases. What I did for the primary setting, I did it for the, for the uh, uh, relapse situation. It's much more complicated, but you know, we deleted the platinum free interval because it's artificial. Nevertheless, if I have a patient with complete resection, the patient can come six months after chemotherapy and maintenance approach, it's much more resistant in my perspective than if you have a patient with residual tumor mass and the patient come after six months. So the question is not to make it black and white, but to understand what can be your approach for surgery? What can you approach for a rich chance of chemotherapy? And can, what can you approach as a maintenance approach, because in general, you can make surgery after surgery, chemo after chemo, PARP after PARP, BEV after BEV, but the effect is in general much weaker. So the question is how to modify. Otherwise, this treatment for interval becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. So I try to bring the elements together. And uh, we know that even HRD is important for uh, the prediction, but it's not strong enough to select the subsequent treatment in relapse situation. So if we see a patient relapse about cancer, again, I do my best for best supportive care, then to look, is this a patient is a candidate for complete resection in, this, in the cell with surgery? And I will present you very shortly the death drop three trial, where we have shown that in patient with complete resection, overall survival is significant affected. In contrast to the American trial, but we can even explain later why. If the patient is not a candidate for surgery, for curative, I have to ask myself if this is a patient for palliative surgery. I can tell you today we did a surgery in the patient with platinum resistant disease and replaced a stent in the arteria iliaca communis. Why? Because she has a bleeding from the communis and the bowel. I did the cover umbrella to prevent the thrombosis. We placed the intraarterial tumor stent and we did today the surgery. In this case, we did the bowel resection, but the tumor and the perisacral area is impossible to do surgery. I planted a net, a vicral net, and in the next day she will be radiated in this case. I never did it like this, but it's a palliative surgery because you have every day bleeding into the bowel because it was ruptured in a high grade BRCA negative ovarian cancer patient. And thanks God, so far everything is, is fine. So if I do surgery, I will always to know what can be the subsequent treatment. That's very important to place it because surgery is a can option, never a must. And even to be much more transparent and we have different options about the re-challenge. 
If I use a platinum or not, it, it depends on the starts of treatment, the toxicity and the impact on the treatment-free interval is more dynamic. And this is what we mean. So death shop three trial is frequently misunderstood. The, the desktop tree trial, and I'm proud that my center enrolled the most patients uh, in this trial, and it will be just, you know, published in very few days in the New England Journal, um, was designed to look if complete resection impact over survival. And the AGO score includes performance status, complete resection as at first surgery, and the site is below 500 milliliters. And this was introduced to increase the chance to achieve complete resection. Otherwise, you have the same story with a neoadjuvant trial. You do surgery trials, but there's no surgery inside. If you want to prove the impact of complete resection over a survivor, you need many patients where you achieve complete resection independent from your individual center. And this was vice versa, if I have a patient with AGR score negativity, I can tell you in my center, in every second woman, we can achieve complete resection. So, and this was published, so it's only unidirectional. So it's not correct to use the AGR score to exclude the patients who are suitable for salvage surgery. So this was the, uh, the outcome over a survival benefit and even the progression-free survival two is significant. The time to subsequent treatment is significant. So, and I can tell you from the ovarian cancer consensus conference, we just defined for trial, this is one of the standard arm if you do a surgical trial in clinical uh, issues. So what we try now to look to improve uh, the AGR score by using HE4 and CA1 to 5. It's an uh, ongoing trial from the ANGOT, from Iona Braiko, from my consultant. And I hope we can improve because using the AGR score, you are able to identify around 72% where you can achieve complete resection. So in ovarian cancer surgery, I think it's very important to know what is the goal. It's quality of life. It's a PFS over survival. For the first relapse, it's over survival. It's possible. And we know that we have long-term survival. Palliative surgery for the final um, of my presentation um, are many options. So we use many uh, packs. So we do it CT guided. So we don't make it open. We don't make it endoscopic. We use it generally in most cases by CT guided um, uh, PEC. Um, if the patient is not suitable for surgery for palliative. And this is one patient who uh, developed a fistular during Bevacizumab. You can see the enlarged small bowel beside the other bowel with the personal customatosis. I did this surgery, it was a very young woman, 44 years, and um, I, I did the uh, complete resection and the patient went really home after seven or eight days. I made only a, a ionostoma and I, it's not my plan, okay? But we just published our tertiary surgery, our quartiary surgery, and even our surgeries uh, with bone resection below one meter in very, uh, individual cases, um, but I think it's important to know that this palliative surgery can be done. So evolution of ovarian cancer, I just touched uh, that we have a dramatic improvement in the possibility how to treat patients with ovarian cancer. And we know that we have subsequent treatment. They are very difficult to compare with each other because control arm is different, method uh, are different, inclusion criteria was different, but nevertheless, I think that maintenance approach will really um, improve the outcome of the patients. So um, this is um, our analysis. It's just a summary of my uh, series and we brought uh, the, um, the series from Christina Fotopoulou, who was my best consultant ever. 
uh, and she is now, you know, in, in Imperial College. And um, again, we have to know that surgery today is much more different than ever before, but we have to look what are the best approach for these patients. And again, um, the difference to the uh, American study is that in our study, there was not so many patients with bevacizumab in the maintenance approach. The colleagues from US have a high uh, amount of patients from Asia, and even they have no strong selection how they um, selected the patient for surgery. And this is the reason um, why we believe that the um, desktop trial is one of standard of care. So the challenges for the next future are many. So I think we need much more precise subclassification of ovarian cancer subtypes. I think we need better discrimination who are really the best candidates for surgery, um, even to understand uh, which patient um, benefit from chemo or for maintenance approach. And I don't believe that everybody uh, should use a cocktail approach to take everything at all. I think we have to think about sequential regimens and even not to ignore PARP resistance because we know in BRCA positive patients, we have five to 10% with reverse mutations, but this will not explain enough um, the heterogeneity and the non-response in it above 20 to 25 percent of all patients uh, with um, PARP uh, uh, treatment and tumor progression. So clinical trials is the answer. I'm, I'm proud that we have developed in the last years many, many clinical trials. And I really like to, to end my presentation um, that the GCIG consensus conference from, Teo from Kyoto, but even from now from the virtual Leuven underlined that we have to take care on the ethnicity. But the question what I had is what do we really know about the Arabic woman all over the world, the Arabic woman in Egypt, the Arabic woman in Germany. And that was the reason why I founded the PARSCO a society to increase the research and even the understanding of the Arabic woman all over the world, and even to show that even the Arabic woman is not a homogeneous group. But I think we need much more visibility um, of uh, this approach. And I invite you personally to be part of this Pan-Arabic Research Society of Gynecology. That's a network from people who believe that this is important from UK, from Germany, from US, from all the Arabic countries. And uh, this is what I really like because, you know, I'm a Moroccan, I'm Arabic in my heart and invite you on the 26th November, we will do even a woman empowerment webinar for patients advocacy groups. Um, and again, thank you very much to invite me to your webinar and happy to see you physically and to work with you in the next future. Thank you very much, Shukran Zizira. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. We can uh, start by uh, asking questions from the audience. We start by Dr. Ahmed Mustafa. Uh, th thank you for your presentation. Uh, just to clarify things, which recurrent ovarian cancer patients that you that you take her back to the OR, to the OR, and to simplify things, from every ten cases with recurrent ovarian cancer, how many cases you take them from the ten to the OR again to try to do resection? This is yes. the first question. The second question regarding HIPIC. Okay, uh, what, okay, let's start with the first question and then we can ask you what you, might, what you mean. So first is um, around one third of patients with relapse of brain cancer run into theater in our center, one third. So first of all, again, discriminate between palliative surgery and surgery where you like to improve the outcome. If the patient come to me, and the treatment-free interval is at least six to 12 months, the patient is fit enough 
the patient has no severe complication by the primary surgery and we have not done multiple bowel anastomosis. And if the patient achieved complete resection, the first setting, then I will do a PET CT. And if I don't see any uh, extra abdominal disease besides the epidiaphragmal lymph node, I will offer surgery. And during surgery, I do my best not to make strong injuries and to look after one or two hours if complete resection is visible. This is the approach we do um, in, in relapse of our cancer surgery. So HIPEC, and, what and, is the question yes. to this, yeah? Yes, and, and, and the one third, uh, how, uh, what's the percentage of the complete cyto reduction in the one third case? I can tell you, the... oh, yeah, 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 okay. It's always depends, it's between 50 to 75%. 50 to 75 percent from the one third yes yeah. and 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 do, do you apply the, the conditions of desktop trial as regards the ascited the platinum sensitivity the the conditions of desktop trial to take them back to the or yes it's even in our guidelines yes it's and even in yeah. the occ it's one of the standards and we have two we have three trials for this we have the shanghai yeah. study the, yeah, from the SGOG, we have the AGO desktop trial and we have the American GOG trial. So two are positive and one is negative. And we believe okay. that our trial based on the criteria we did in the center who are trained is an option we should offer. It's not a must, it's an offer. And again, if I don't see I can help the patient during surgery. I will stop my surgery and go out. It's not, it's not losing my face. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, that's our uh, philosophy and our strategy. And as regards the high pick, where is, the, is there a placement for high pick in your center? So I, I will tell you first, in relapse, there's no place. First, relapse, okay. no place. Because what we have, we have one very, very, very bad trial from the Greece. It's a very, very negative trial. And all the other trials are negative, even from the MD Anderson, from the Sloan Kettering, are so far negative. We have one trial, what is positive in neoadjuvant setting in a situation where the doctors believe without surgery, this patient is not a candidate for primary surgery, they're inoperable. They give them two or three cycles chemo, neo event, and then they run to surgery. This is the, 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 the um, Scandinavian trial. This trial is trying to be confirmed by a new trial, but so far in our guideline, HIPEC is an experimental approach. I know the difference in philosophy, but in the OCC, the Ovarian Cancer Consensus Conference, including the Netherlands, including the Italian, 23 countries stated that this is not a standard of care in the trials. So that's the only thing. So again, I'm not against anything, but in some, most of the ovarian cancer stories it's not a question of chemo so because AUC 21 high dose chemo you can do it by ovarian cancer but we showed already the studies there's no benefit regarding PFS and over survivors there's no dose dense what I don't say that we have cancers that normal classical treatment is not good enough mucinous cancer clear cell whatever but that's the reason why in Germany I can tell you HIPEC is an experimental approach. It's, it's in all guidelines, even with, with the surgeons. So there's no doubt that some centers can do everything, but I will tell you for the standard of the global, that's the reason why we are very critical to HIPEC. Because surgery is the key point, surgery, not the treatment at all. Uh, Dr. Mathat Khafagi. Okay, 
thank you, Dr. Khaled, uh, for this lecture. I have two questions. First, over the years, are we gaining more cure? Because you know that ovarian cancer, malignant ovarian cancer, uh, kills 70% of, of the candidates. Yes. Are we gaining better cure over the last 10 years? Yes. That's one thing. So long as you are giving chemotherapy, right? How long do you maintain chemotherapy for metastatic ovarian cancer? Is it six months, 12 months, two years, whatever it is? Yeah. It's a very important question. So longer chemotherapy, if you, we talk about primary situation, longer treatment than six months is not beneficial for the patients at all. So longer than six months chemo make no sense. Maintenance approach, bevacizumab, 15 months is not inferior to 30 months. This is just, we published the data from the BOOST study. We made a study 50 months to three, bevacizumab angiogenesis. PARP inhibition is giving two years. And so far, 65% in BRCA positive are without progression after five years in BRCA positive patients, independent from the tumor residuals. If you have achieved complete resection, it's even much higher than 65%. So for primary situation, longer than six cycles make no sense. In relapse, the same. What I doing now, a new trial, what I like to do, and it will be supported by GSK, to make a surgery trial, complete resection, then to look to give only three cycles in comparison to six cycles, and then to give maintenance approach. I'm sure there's no differences, but we will see. Because again, surgery is a key point, And I think chemo is important, but not to extend too long there's no benefit, and we have many trials even to try to extend chemo. There's no benefit for this. But I believe that maintenance approach is crucial. This is my, my personal philosophy to increase, increase the surgical rate, to decrease chemotherapy, and to introduce maintenance approach. This is my personal attitude how to make better improvement for our patients. Are we curing more patients now than before? Yes, yes. yes. Are we curing? And what, what's more? Because what you, mean you, more? The, uh, you know that ovarian cancer kills 70% of the female yes. of, uh, are subjected to our, uh, of ovarian, malignant ovarian cancer. Yes. Over the last 10 years, are we yes. curing more the five or 10 year survival? Is more than before? Yes. And if it it's is more, difficult. how much? It's very difficult to tell you because, again, it depends on your surgical. I will tell you. In all in all, all in all. No no, all no, 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 you cannot give this answer all in all because if you give all in all, I have to in introduce all the centers in the world. And most of the centers are not- No, no, in your center, in your center. Yes, I can tell you that our survival rate every five to 10 years increased from five to 10%, five to 10%, but it's a sum. It's a sum of increasement. Oh, it's not I... so negative as you maybe expect. It's still improving. Oh. And again, in, in, even if you'd not achieve cure, you have long-term survivor. So we have now, I only tell you, in our environment, since six years, we have 1,100 long-term survivor with, with, with their life longer than five years. So it's still increasing step by step. Nevertheless, it's one of the most killing disease, but we make step-by-step -step improvement. Thank you. Yeah. I know it's a difficult thing, but again, it's step by step, but it's 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 moving. It's moving. Okay, thank you, uh, Doctor Gamal Amira. You you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, uh, Professor, for your very nice and interesting talk. My question is, in in such advanced cases. 
what are the indications for new adjuvant chemotherapy? And if the patient fails to respond for new adjuvant therapy, do you still go to surgery or you uh, know that the prognosis is dismal and you interfere only with complications? Yeah, yeah. That's a wonderful question. So the trials you know, the year 2 c the CORUS trial, the Japanese trial, they did a neoadjuvant trial in patients with very advanced disease. Complete resection rate was around 20%. What is dramatically poor, 20%, yeah? It's, it's nothing. At least 50%, this is a goal for good centers. 50% of advanced disease should be complete resected. In these studies, they made randomization and they give neoadjuvant chemo. And if they responded, then they did surgery, a very simple surgery. And what you said to make surgery, if the patient non-responded, they not done this in the study, but in the trust trial, we did it in Germany and all over the world was close to 1000 patients, but the result will come 2024. I will tell you, we did the surgery even in case of progression. I can tell you morbidity is getting bump, 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 very high. So this is not my recommendation. If the patient is not responding to chemo, I am not a fan to go to chemo. Nevertheless, interval surgery should not be done later than three cycles. There's no indication to make surgery after six cycles. There's nothing in the world that this show you beneficial for the patient. We published my series after six cycles because the patient came late and we have seen that patient who achieved complete resection live longer than not, but this is not the evidence. So I never recommend to give surgery after more um, later than three cycles. That's even again, the international consensus. Neoadjuvant chemo is for me a patient where I cannot go to surgery. Lung emboli, for instance, a, a fresh lung emboli, because you know they may sometimes have two, three weeks later a pneumonia or a very deep thrombosis sometimes. Um, then I will do neoadjuvant <laughs> chemo, but I try to make it very short. So I not give three or six cycles every three weeks. I give it weekly, 80 milligrams or 60 milligram Texol, AUC2, and to give two applications, three applications, then to look if the patient's fit enough, make a break of three to four weeks and then to go to surgery. What I like to discriminate, neoadjuvant with the aim of surgery and then have patients without surgery. Then I do laparoscopy. And if the patient have brain metastasis, lung metastasis, liver metastasis, then I do primary chemo plus antibody treatment. Yes, so I don't do interval surgery. It's not neoadjuvant, it's primary medical treatment. And if you have got a good response with the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, yes. Do, so, you, do, do, do you remove all the diseased uh, parts before neoadjuvant or you treat the remnants only? The remnants, uh, I mean, if the peritoneum was involved do you still go to remove the peritoneum after response, good response or complete response to chemotherapy? No. You are right. That's, that is a key point why neoadjuvant is not working because you cannot do surgery in the old landmark. It's impossible. So if you have a patient with mesentery metastasis and you give chemotherapy and she responded, you never will take the mesentery out. So my recommendation is make it simple. Not go to the old landmark because nobody knows where are the landmarks. Do what you can do, but make it easy. Yes, so my aggressive surgery is not so aggressive in interval surgery than in primary, but concentrate on the tissue where you see cancer. This is my approach, not to go to the old landmarks because you never know the old landmarks. And second, there's no impact so far that you can really revise the primary situation. And you have patients with complete resection 
and even pathological remission. And I did many studies in relapse. It's not the same always. You have some clones, they are very sensitive and some of them not. So in relapse of brain cancer, we focus on the disease, what we see. Thanks very much. And we hope to see you in the NCI in Cairo. Inshallah, I, I hope. Inshallah. Thank you. Because in Egypt, yeah. food is better. If food is better and sun is better. So many reasons <laughs> to come. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Do you have any question? Any other questions from the audience? I think we have two questions in the chat. Uh, Ala is asking in residual disease for stage three, will offer chemo then resection or try surgery first? Surgery first. Okay, and uh, another question. Uh, can we offer chemotherapy taxol as maintenance therapy if we don't have target therapy like Avastin or Olparib? No. No, there's a study from Markman, they did it. There's no differences in progression-free survival and over-survival. So if we have no uh, maintenance, I will, I will say then use BEF if you have. If not, then um, not continuous chemotherapy. In low-grade ovarian cancer, I use, in many cases, anti hormonal treatment, literatol, as a maintenance based on the retrospective study of Gershenson from the Emily Anderson in low grade. I use chemo and then I stop chemo and then I give literosol. Um, but uh, not please continue with chemo. It's a negative trial already published. Okay. And one, uh, another question in the chat is, uh, what is negative impact of neoadjuvant preoperative treatment on the primary surgery of ovarian cancer? It's very simple. So again, you have ovarian cancer and you say it's too huge and you have the tumor in the mesentery. I can show you one second. I have a, I have a model here. Ah, okay. Here, this is the question is I think from the medical oncologist. It's a medical oncologist, the question. Yeah. Likely, most likely. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So I can show you now a picture. Yeah. So this is a mesentery, okay? And we believe that the cancer was disseminated, okay? And this is the uterus with the ovary. Yeah? I can show you the ovary. So, yeah. so now you do chemotherapy and tumor is shrinking. Shrinking not as a ball. Um, ovarian cancer means it's shrinking here, shrinking here, shrinking here, and shrinking here. So you do now surgery. The problem is what you do with the cancer here. So what you can do, you can remove the uterus, but very simple, like this. But the cancer will be present and persistent here. So you make artificial surgery. This is my key problem. I love easy surgeries, but the problem is that you cannot change the tumor pattern. And that's the reason. So again, if you do neoadjuvant, try your best to make it very short because you do surgery in a blind. You do surgery blind because you have remission and then you are afraid that the patient will come in the next three to six months after chemo, they're resistant. It's an 80% chance that they come platinum resistant. Watch your patient, you will see it. So try your best not to give chemo. If you give chemo, very short. One cycle, two cycle, not later than three cycles. Okay. And another uh, question for stage one ovarian cancer with incomplete resection. Uh, is it better to offer re resection, completion, or do you give chemotherapy? Okay. So it's impossible to have residuals in stage one. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. So if you have stage one residuals, it's not a stage one, it should be maybe stage three A or whatever. Okay. immediately to do surgery <laughs> there's no discussion in early stage systematic lymph nodes and complete resection there's no discussion because again there's no maintenance approach and these patients you can cure very high 80 90 percent and then you can even think about to give three cycles or six cycles chemotherapy in early stage but it's impossible in one stage stage one 
in stage two to have residuals. Okay, but if it's stage three, for example, if it's a later stage. If it's stage which... three, it depends where are the residuals. If I see the midline incision, I can show you, I'm very direct here. Yeah? So if I see my patient and she has a cut like here, okay? And, and the report tell me it's surgical, it's residuals. I can tell you I make immediately surgery. If I see the cut is like here, and I see the surgery was three, four, five hours, and the, and the surgical team was good, then maybe I do chemotherapy. It depends on the environment. If I report, I read the report, Friday, one o'clock open, 1.30 close in the Friday, I will make new surgery. So I think it's not black and white, yes, but again, where is the tumor? But to offer this to the patient, and there are some situations where you say, okay, give one cycle to make a bridge concept. It's for your soul, but it's not really evident, but you can do this. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa. Yes. Dr. Khaled, first, we enjoy so much the, the presentation and the it's discussion. Okay. My question mm -hmm. as regard the, the role of uh, biopsy and cutoff point and cutoff of CA125. Some cases you have an omental disease, the ovaries are not large, but they are diseased, and the CA125 is 100. So is this enough to diagnose? the case and go and go directly for surgery or should we go for biopsy yeah okay so uh, yeah, yeah yeah it's it's very yeah it's a very important question so biomarker it's not easy biomarker what we have to know we need to dynamic so it's it's if i have a patient with c125 is 100 we also use h4 I use also LDH and we look even if the patient with anemia. So um, I think it's not problematic. So if you have a patient, see a strong, a strong patient, then I always recommend to make biopsy and then to run in the surgery. If you have a patient, she is very fragile. You don't want to make two or three psych surgeries at all. Then it's better to make it in one. But then I want to recommend to make it one or two weeks later to look what has happened with the CO125. But you know, CO125 is only high in serious high grades. If you have low grade, if you have endometriid, if you have carcinosarcoma of the ovary, CO125 can, must not be very high. So if it's very unclear, make a laparoscopy and make a very short biopsy go out make a surgery, but very short, not make 100 biopsies, make one, one tube pump pump, 10 minutes go out and then to wait for the patient, train the patient. So for me, it's much better to be clear in the concept. Yeah. So um, I know, um, and you know, fresh frozen, the pathologists more and more are not able to tell you it's cancer or not because they need immunohistochemistry, Sometimes they need additional molecular markers. So I think it's good to, to make um, two-stage algorithm if it's unclear. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Dr. Gamel. Yes, I have uh, two questions. First question for carcinosarcoma of the uterus. Should we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy or no? Because the prognosis and the recurrence rate is always high. Second question, uh, I had two cases of uh, clear cell adenocarcinoma after DNC of the uterus. And when I explored the patients, of course, I, I, before exploration, I had CT and it showed uh, ovarian masses. But when I opened, I saw a picture like ovarian carcinoma completely, omental cake and nodules everywhere. 
it was a clear uh, cell of the uterus? Do you think it is originally yeah. ovarian? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, the clear cell carcinoma, it's, you know, it's really a big, big challenge because in general, they are not chemosensitive. They can associate it with endometriosis and they can even be simultaneously. So what I think uh, in clear cell carcinoma that you um, have to know that these patients are different. We do CPS score. They in general, so we look on PDL, we look on uh, estrogen, progesterone, they are generally negative. And we run in generally in surgery if we have a patient and generally at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's from the uterus or the ovary because um, the origin will be the similar. So, uh, but I, I have similar experiences. The cancer sarcoma of the uterus is really complex because we know this, the outcome is bad. They have a high rate of lymph node metastasis. So what we do is CT scan of the thorax, CT scan of the abdomen. We do also a bone scan because some of these cases have bone metastasis. And then in general, if they have no metastasis in the liver on the lung, we, do, we go in surgery. I know that in some cases, you can use neoadjuvant chemotherapy in endometric cancer, if they have high proliferation, I know, know that Nicoletta Colombo have a series. So we use it very, very few. Yes, very few. But I think this can be an option in this patient group because the outcome, what you already mentioned, is bad. So what we do in carcinosarcoma of the uterus, we do microsatellite instability, MSI. We look on P53. And we look on CPS, so PDL and the immune competent cells. And then we look in general to go to surgery uh, if the patient has no distant metastasis. If they have a distant metastasis, we in generally give chemo. If they have MSI positivity or P53 positivity, we can even treat now the patient with pembrolizumab and lenvantinib is just approved in Germany. Um, as a combination uh, for all endometrial cancer. And at the moment, it's not separated from carcinoma or coma of the uterus. But it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Heba Gamal. Dr. Heba, on mute, please. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I, I want to ask about uh, the, the biomarker HE4. Um, is there is a place for the use of HE4 with CA125 for the follow-up of patients who had undergone a complete cytoreduction in their primary surgery? This is my first question. And my second question is about the second blue laparoscopy. If there is a role now for it, if the marker is high and there is no evidence of clinical disease. Yeah, very good. Two uh, very good questions. So first of all, HE4 and CO125, it's introduced for Roma for the primary situation to discriminate B9 from malignant ovarian masses. Um, and we use its uh, standard of care as additional information. In the cancer care, it's very controversial because you know that CO125, it's not accepted in the monitoring of relapse over in cancer. But I agree, we have to think about it because we have surgery with over survival. We have the PARP inhibition and antiangenesis for um, progression-free survival and subsequent uh, therapy interval. So we have to rethink. So I use CA125 in the follow-up and even to look on the individual marker. If the patient is CA125 negative from the beginning, then the addition of HE4 can make this patient biomarker sensitive in around 20, 25%. So high grade. If I have a high grade ovarian cancer patient, I use HE4 if the CA125 was in the beginning negative. This is... Uh, my approach. If the CR125 increase 
from 10 to 20, 20 to 30. I do PET CT. I never do laparoscopy to look, cancer is there. I do PET CT in high grade ovarian cancer. Because why? Because first, laparoscopy is not the best situation to identify all visible diseases, whatever you do, because it's 1.2 square meters and you can only see a special room after laparotomy and radical patronectomy. Some of the patients have pleurofusion, some of them have positive lymph nodes, and that's the reason I re recommend PET-CT. If you have no PET-CT, I will start with CT of the thorax with contrast metal enhancement and abdomen. And then I will follow the patient all six to eight weeks by ultrasound and by imaging. So I don't like to go by laparoscopy, not by why I'm not doing laparoscopy, because I know the high limitation and the PET-CT give me more information even for my indication to run in laparotomy or not. So very active uh, group, um, Hisham, you have. I never have such a wonderful discussion at nine yeah, o'clock. The that's only that's your Egyptian yeah. power. It's unbelievable. It's it. It's nine. It's uh, ten, uh, what time is it now in Berlin? Nine uh, or ten? Nine o'clock. Yeah, it's ten now in Egypt. Yeah, the uh, questions are always the interesting part. You have any more questions? Thank you. Do you do you have any questions to us? Yes. When do you invite me personally? So digital <laughs> digital is simple. But no, no, soon, I soon. joke. No, I like it very much. And even I, I learned. So even to explain you, it's not it's not black and white. Yes. But nevertheless, we have to to summarize the science we have and then to have an attitude and then to start new trials. Yes. So we are still yeah. having many, many challenges in ovarian cancer, but we cannot ignore the science. We have to be critical. I'm very critical. If you believe I do surgery always. No. I'm, I'm becoming older and I'm being more critical, but step by step to make the best knowledge together. I know it's difficult. I know we even kill patients by surgery. I know, but we can even help the patients by moderating this, these aspects. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, Masalema. Tazbah ala khair and uh, shukran. Thank you for uh, yeah. Um, and yeah. see you in Cairo in January. Inshallah. Slema. Masara. Slema. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Slema.